Welcome to Diane. And as we talked before, Aaron and you, could you please explain how the uh, book is going to Turkey? Okay, I'll, I'll just decide to translate it and then how the story begin. Are, are we going to translate or we just, I think we'll, we'll speak in English, Maybe, right? Maybe, uh, Diane, uh, if you, uh, could you explain us how you uh, write the book, why you need to write this book and what you would like to explain to the people? Maybe you can begin that story, then the Turkish story going to begin. Okay. I'm so excited to be here for starters. Uh, thank you for having me. I read a book called uh, Teeming with Microbes, which some of you may know of. Yeah. And I found it fascinating, but not everybody did. So I wanted to um, bring that information in a more accessible, more readable form. And I just found the whole soil food web amazing. I grew up gardening. My dad was a was a loved gardening and I worked with him in the yard, but he used a lot of chemicals and he had everything very manicured. Only grass grew in the lawn. Um, so I wanted to get this information out about a different kind of gardening. I also read uh, Ruth Stout who wrote no work gardening. She she believed mm. in mulching really deeply, and I read that in college many years ago, and started started gardening more that way and with less chemicals and with a lot of mulch on the soil and sheltering the soil food web. But I didn't learn that much about it until I read Teeming with Microbes and decided I wanted to make that a little more fun. And, and you did it, I think. <laughs> it sounds like you did too. You did a yeah, great job was, translating. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if it's okay, I, I'll just uh, tell the story from my side and then uh, give it back to you. Uh, I'm also a permaculture designer and teacher and uh, a student of uh, Elaine Ingham's Soil Food Web. So I am... Uh, I'm obviously in love with soil and the life uh, within it. And this uh, Doğan Kitap, which is a publishing company in Turkey, they wanted to decide to start a new series called the Sustainable Living Series. And they consulted me, consulted me uh, for the book. So uh, I'm always searching for the books, looking for what is new in this uh, field. Uh, when I come across your book, uh, actually the title... Uh, beauty, magic, and tomatoes. I, I think it just got me. I just, I thought, no, this is this is my thing. This is what I feel like. It is the feeling because you, it is it is magic. It is magical actually. I'm mesmerized by the things happening within the soil. So uh, I started reading your book, and uh, it's actually the humor got me. And you have all these. Uh, I don't know, formal academic information, actually, but you made them into a funny, readable book. It's, it's really good because while we were teaching permaculture, we were uh, telling people about teaming with microbes, teaming with fun fungi, but, you know, there are kind of academic books. Not everybody is into them. I was always hoping for a book that uh, I will be able to uh, recommend everybody like beginners, even to my mom. My mom also had read your book, my translation, and she loved it. <laughs> She's a gardener and she loved it. And uh, so I was very excited when I read your book. And uh, your writing style is also very good, I think. You use very beautiful analogies, like building a house analogy, making everything look so fun and easy. But again, I say plus with the necessary information. So it's a book that would make everybody love soil. And it's a, it has lots of practical information in it. Like it's, uh, when I read it, 
uh, although I am into this stuff, but I feel excited and I wanted to take your book under my arm and run to the garden and do some of the stuff that you're doing. Like, and you have very interesting stories like uh, this, this one with uh, adding plants. Maybe I'm going too deep now, but it's just an introduction to uh, maybe you'll um, talk more about them. Like you, you talk about adding disease plant parts into the compost like uh, with pathogens like disease causing microbes in it it's like uh, using vaccines to yeah. boost the immune system of the humans you're trying to boost the immune system of the soil so this is a really good analogy and this is what i believe like every what we believe actually uh, i think most of the permaculture designers every system every ecosystem actually runs in a similar way. So you got all these uh, parts together in a very funny way. So I think it's a valuable book. Uh, so it was my first recommendation to this series. And uh, I told them like, this is a must have book because I, I believe with this book, a lot of people will start doing something, not just reading it and having fun uh, because you made it look so easy. And it is easy actually. And uh, one last thing about this book, uh, it also got my attention. I think it was the title called uh, How to Not Make Your Neighbors Hate You. So it was it was excellent because we always say that this permaculture design, the, the design we are talking about is like design has two features, aesthetics and function, but we are functional designers. But uh, uh, permaculture design also aesthetic so but you made it uh, I don't know sound so funny so I liked it you know yeah how to not make your neighbors hate you so this is your functional but you can be aesthetic and look tidy at the same time so all these things made me love the book and I love the I love translating it I love your language your humor so I I think I had some hard time to translate it to Turkish in a way that because all these uh, jokes and funny parts you're using in English, so I have to think about them to find their counterparts in Turkish, uh, not to sound like a direct translation. So I hope I could give the Turkish audience your humor, uh, some part of your humor, so I hope they'd like it uh, as the English audience. So. I talked a lot, but <laughs> this is what I feel about this book. Uh, so I, I truly loved your book and I'm really proud of translating it to Turkish. Oh, thank you. I'm so honored that you did that. I was amazed to hear that somebody in Turkey wanted to publish my book. So. <laughs> Exciting for me. Yeah. And I, maybe if I, I can ask the first question, like what, what do you say? Because this is what I wonder. So I, uh you're you're it looks like you're having so much fun uh doing gardening so like have you been always like this i know it, you started with your father but this attitude or did you decided to come up with this attitude to write this book or are you really enjoying this so much doing all this fun stuff uh, whenever you went into the garden this is what i wonder or or you just use it in the book <laughs> um, I do have fun gardening. It's my, mm -hmm. my favorite way to spend a day off. And it's, it's easier the way I do it, I think, because I just pull up weeds and throw them mm -hmm. down instead of a big day of, of weeding and getting rid of stuff. Um, everything I do pretty much goes into mulch. Mm -hmm. um, I hope people understand me. Okay, but... Um, yeah, so when I'm out puttering, out working in my yard, I, I prune things and cut them up into mulch and I pull up weeds and sow them down for mulch and everything goes back to feed the soil. So tell me what, what's the um, translation of the title in Turkish? Hmm. Uh, actually, it's like uh, grow your soil is like kendi uh, toprağınızı yetiştirin. Actually, we had some uh, discussions about the uh, title. 
mm-hmm. because uh, I think your title is also like you don't grow soil, uh, but you grow it in a way like like you know you yeah. uh, it's uh, so we we kind of use the same thing like. Uh, we said like uh, maybe it's a direct translation, but it's like produce your own soil, like uh, not okay. grow. Yeah. Uh, because when you when we say grow, it's I don't know it's so Turkish yetiştirmek uh, kendi toprağınızı yetiştirin. When we say that toprak is soil, own is kendi. But when we if we use yetiştirmek instead of uh, üretmek, it would it would be something. Uh, less understandable for the Turkish audience mm-hmm. and uh, we use actually like produce produce your own soil but uh-huh. uh, yeah makes... it, is, it is the title but yeah uh, but one of our tutors says that soil is cannot be uh, how can I say uh, in Turkish world uh, is it's not appropriate for the title because uh, soil comes from the long way to be the, the particles coming from the long way it needs to be 100 year or 1000 <laughs> year and we can just only make the compost uh, and, and it is not soil that there is a difference between them mm-hmm. so that there is some concerns about it hmm. gotcha. yeah yeah we, we discussed it but i think this is uh, the title needs to be catchy, like you don't grow soil or you don't produce soil. But if the title is like uh, make some compost and in a hundred years it will become soil. So <laughs> I think it's not <laughs> catchy. So I think this is uh, like you wonder uh, how, how can I produce soil? How can I grow soil? Like uh, I can't grow actually. So you, you started reading the book and... When you start to read the book, actually, you see that it's talking about making compost, feeding the soil, feeding the soil life. So I think this is uh, using this this title is uh, makes people wonder how can I do that? This is maybe it's not possible. Then you start reading and like it is possible. You become a part of this process. So uh, I don't know. I think it's a catchy title, both in English and Turkish. But yeah, we had we had this discussion. We had this yeah. discussion. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So how how how how did you come up with this title? Like, do you do, I, do you usually use growing soil or? Uh, My publisher what? actually came up with the title. Uh, I had a very long title called uh, of "Worms, Germs, Biodiversity, and Afternoon Naps: An Aging oh, Hippie's nice. Guide to Gardening for Fun and." carbon sequestration but they Uh thought that was too long somehow (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think a catchy title is uh it's good like uh it's like the last book of uh darwin the worms it's translated to turkish as the worms but the original title is like i think two sentences long like how Uh how the garden worms had the formation of a gardening soil something something something but it, they just translated <laughs> the title okay worms <laughs> yeah worms so, is catchier yeah worms <laughs> is catchier so yeah they do that so do you still have your garden and keep gardening and how uh-huh. how, how how big a garden do you have you live in the suburban area or where, where like in the city I live a little, a little ways outside of a gold rush town, a town from the 100 years ago, 150 mm. years. And it's a sloped lot. So um, I have retaining walls and narrow strips of gardening. So I have chard and I'm about to mm-hmm. plant tomatoes mm-hmm. and eggplant and peppers. And I have a, a strip along the street with a lot of flowers and fruit trees so mm-hmm. yeah I'm beating back the weeds right now there's a lot of a lot of grass oh, growing okay. I don't want it yeah so so are you are you affected because before we start we were talking about like losing the seasons the the, the sharp cold days and hot days are mm-hmm. you and your garden are affected by this because we are in Istanbul it's hard to control things because they are 
they're out of the patterns that we know do you do you feel the same and how do you cope with it yeah i um just try to work around it we had a a freeze went right mm -hmm. after my fruit trees started to set fruit so i think i lost my fruit this year it was a strange mm -hmm. time of year to to get that cold uh, so i think i won't have fruit this year i have little shriveled mm -hmm. up nectarines and peaches and mm -hmm. um and water is a big issue the mm -hmm because it gets so hot, it's hard to keep things watered as much as I'd like. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna be, we're gonna have limits on how much water we can use this year. Mm -hmm. So I mulch a lot to yeah. help conserve the water and I grow a little bit less. I guess I've lost some of my shrubs and things because of the drought. Mm -hmm. So do you, um, do you get freezes there? Yes, we got freezes. Uh, actually, uh, not much in Istanbul. We used to know our times that we had freezes. But this year, I think we have two additional freezes uh, at the times that we did the, we wasn't expecting. Uh, so yeah, it was we we lost some of our crops, uh, but. The main problem was uh, for us uh, in actually I'm now doing we are doing urban gardening and uh, we're basically working in a project on on on a rooftop. It's uh, oh, a hundred wow. hundred square meter. Yeah, it's the urban garden. We're producing products uh, for for the cafe of a place called Postane. And uh, we started last year uh, with the COVID and it was okay. But this year the weather was so erat erratic. Uh, actually, the, the, the plants kept growing during the winter time. So, but, and we couldn't uh, get them off because they looked so beautiful. And we kept harvesting the kales and everything. Uh -huh. and they, they kept growing and growing. And when the summertime came, like we, we uh, seeded some seedlings but they they didn't come because it was like this unexpected freezes the weather was cold and they came came up uh, they seeded and we took them out in the garden and then it is really hot now i don't know we are we're kind of struggling but we're trying to cope with it by using more and more compost we are using more compost uh, in the in the raised beds and yes we are mulching a lot we weren't mulching that much uh, last year but we're mulching a lot and uh, the water is also a problem uh, we were we are using our rainwater we are collecting the rainwater from the rooftop uh, but it's obvious that it's, it's never, ever going to be enough this year. So we have to, we didn't install our like uh, pipes to water under the mulch. But I think this year we have to do, do it. So, yeah, it's a kind mm -hmm. of different, different, uh, I don't know uh, what's going to happen. We try to, uh, we have some, um, we try to, I don't know, write down all the dates that we have, like uh, unexpected hot weather or freezes. Uh, maybe we will come up with a pattern, but, you know, it's going to take three or five years. If it continues, we don't know what we're going to see next year because we had lots of snow in unexpected times this year. Mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the, the new pattern is no pattern. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the new pattern is no pattern. So we are we are trying our best. I don't know. <laughs> does it rain there in the summer? Yeah, it does actually. It does. It's a it's yeah, a kind it of yeah, rainy rainy city, Istanbul. I can't say that it's a dry city, it's it's a rainy city. Uh but I think for the last Three years, it's also, it's like it rains a lot for a day and the other day or in the same day, it's too hot. Mm -hmm. Kind of sometimes you feel like you're living in the tropics. Yeah. So this is, wow. the, this is the feeling I get for the last uh, three years, actually. This, I don't know, maybe it's, it's only me. Uh, but it's, it's different. 
Hi, yeah, question we have... about the permaculture community of you. Do you have any permaculture yeah. community in there? There is. There's a woman here who teaches the class I went to, and um, there are a lot of community-supported agriculture gardens, farmers who uh, you subscribe and you get a big box of vegetables every week. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people interested in permaculture. They're, they Most of them still till. I think mm -hmm. it's a hard transition to make to not, not tilling on a commercial basis, but um yeah there's a there's also people who grow marijuana up here so yeah. they're they're very agriculturally oriented too uh -huh. yeah people in the community mm -hmm. yeah a lot of different kinds of farmers here And so, is there any questions from the people who are attended the meeting? Uh, you can open the, your voice and you can ask the question. Or any comments, or you can maybe share your experiences with us. Use this as a platform to share your experiences. You take him back up. Are there in? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm doing the other job. Are we? They are still, still reading the book. That's right. Not finished yet. Okay. So I don't think that we have any farmers. I think we are all have we have gardeners. There is one question from Melis. Okay. Uh, are you seeing the chat session of the Zoom there? Seeing the, I saw a chat come up about forest fires. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big problem here. Yeah. We've had, mm -hmm. had to evacuate once and we've had many days where there's smoke, where the, it's hard to go outside because the smoke is so heavy from fires close by. Yeah, it's scary. My daughter's thinking of moving to North Carolina where there are no natural disasters, she disasters, says. Yeah. <laughs> and and after, I, I have a qu related question. I, I think there was a question about using the ashes. Uh, mm, mm -hmm. Ashes left from the, like, there were those, oh, it's not a question, huh? It's a question. There, there were those who made compost with the ashes left from the fire. How do you approach fires in terms of soil? Is the question. And I, I'll add another question to this. Uh, how? What is the procedure after the fire uh, in there? Because we we have discussions in Turkey, but whenever a fire happens, because it's the Mediterranean. It, it burns uh, all this uh, like trees are they they are actually they you they are used to fire they grow with the fire but uh, whenever a place burns they come and they just plant trees there they don't just wait for the uh, the environment to recover itself the land to recover itself and we have a discussion some people say that just let the land to recover itself don't just go there and like put some of the trees that you think that that will be good. But if you just wait uh, for the land to recover, it will be more sustainable, they said. This is one side. And the other side said that this is the Mediterranean. It is too dry. It is not possible in the short term to land to recover itself. So we need to help it with planting trees. So this is this is also my additional question. What What do people usually do after a big fire? Uh, here, I don't hear about them planting trees, but I think um, the difference is that fi the fires are more catastrophic because they're suppressed for so long. Mm -hmm. I think small fires are natural, but these huge fires are, are not as natural. And I think maybe nature needs some help to reestablish. Mm -hmm. I would like to see diversity, not just one kind of tree planted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
But, and as far as composting ashes, I think, I think ashes can be valuable. They do make the soil more alkali, less acidic. And ashes add a lot of potassium. Uh, so depending on what your soil, what, what soil you're starting with, you might want to use them in moderation. But I think fire improves soil. Natural fires do. Mm -hmm. And the heat yeah. sort of, the heat scarifies, do you know that word? It, it um, activates seeds so that they'll yeah. sprout. Sometimes yeah. the heat is fire. So new things will come up that wouldn't have grown otherwise. Yeah. But I think the real problem is like the 90, 95% of the fires today are not natural fires. I think this is why people are scared and they want to intervene because the fires are caused by humans. Yeah. Yeah. And suppressed by humans. So they're yes. bigger when they happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. There any other questions? I'm so excited that you have a, a big permaculture community there. Yeah, actually we do in Turkey, I think. Uh, and more and more people are into permaculture now. It is a thing. Everybody's, mm -hmm. yeah, we're in a small circle, but in our small circle, <laughs> everybody's talking about permaculture. It's the big thing. Everybody's, everything is perma. everything is about permaculture right now in Turkey. Like, <laughs> uh, it's sometimes funny because all, you know, the things that are not related to permaculture, but still people say, oh, this is permaculture. What is the good thing? I think every good thing about the soil or the nature they heard, they say that, oh, this must be permaculture. And yeah, it is permaculture, we say. So they have to begin somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good people are thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think more than 1,500 people uh, has a PDC. Mm -hmm. and the community wow. is big, but who is making something is restricted the number is restricted restricted in that point mm -hmm. yeah yeah we'll get there so i have a question actually <laughs> if nobody's asking uh like uh, what is your of course i i know what is in the book but what is your experience with biochar like i was still using it are you using it a lot and do you because the thing that we're not doing here now uh in the urban context is biochar because we are in a building but we are trying to come up with some ways uh to be less make it it make it less dangerous to do it in a building and use biochar and what is your experience with biochar and do you think that it's uh it should be, you know, we should find a way to uh, to use it in the cities, in the urban context. So it's so it's so useful. So, what is your experience with biochar, basically? I um, well, we because we live in the woods, we have um, mm -hmm. we have trees that we have to uh, thin and burn, mm -hmm. or things that fall down. We have sort of a woodsy lot. And I make biochar because of that. I, I build a sort of an upside down campfire with the small stuff on top and the mm -hmm. bigger stuff on the bottom. And then you don't get as much smoke. You start, you light the fire on the top. So I mix that into my compost. I tried experimenting by putting it in one area and not another, but I'm not a very good experimenter. So, mm -hmm. so I don't really know if that made a difference, but um, I do mix it into my compost. Mm, yeah. I think, I think if you have it, it's good. It seems to um, retain nutrients longer than mm -hmm. other types of soil. 
uh, but I, I don't think you should worry about it if you don't have it, if you don't have a source. Yeah. They do make biochar um, incinerators. They're, mm -hmm. they're a double walled metal thing that you can make it in a small space outside without, without worrying about starting a fire. But yeah. It just sort of depends on what you have, which is the basis of permaculture is use, use what you have. And mm -hmm. that usually will be enough. Yeah, actually, yeah, that was uh, that was my point because like uh, in this context, we don't have like wood or like uh, branches. We are not pruning, so but this biochar, I know it's it's it's also kind of magical thing. But like, I was thinking that we should find a way to get biochar into our garden. So yeah, but you can yeah, make. Nice. What's that? Yeah. You can make all the organic uh, things. You can make from the uh, oh. orange. You can make orange. Portugal kabuk levdan yapabiliyorsun. Başka şeylerden de yapabiliyorsun. Peels or the or peel seeds. Of the orange, yeah. Olive olive seeds, yeah. You can make yeah, more. Can use... Yeah. I didn't. I didn't follow that. What was that? You can make biochar with. Orange peels, and I don't oh, know that. Oh, I see. But I, yeah, but I, I know that you can use bones, seeds to make biochar. Yes. Yeah. We tried with the bones, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the result of the uh, compost with the bokashi compost with the uh, biochar from the bones are worked very well. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, wow. We tried at the school. Uh huh. With the secondary school students. Uh huh. Oh, that's great! You're doing it in schools. Yeah, they we have a group a, here that they had a prize yeah. from that experiment. Did they? Wow. Mm -hmm. We have a group here that goes into schools and grows vegetables and serves them with the school lunches, so they get something besides. I'm working with the schools and the students, and uh, we have a small garden at the school, and we are gardening in there with the students. And after that, we are cooking. We have a cooking lesson, and we are cooking with the what we grow at the garden. Yeah. We are cooking them. Uh, there That's is a, they can see the chain, and they can see the loop, uh, and we can make the compost with the Bokashi compost and they can see all the stage of the gardening. So that in, in, in one stage, in, one, the, uh, in, in the one point, we made that experiment with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it makes vegetables more appealing, doesn't it? They'll eat yeah. the vegetables. <laughs> and Bokashi compost is working at the school very well because uh, they are cooking uh, in the school. The, the school go, uh, the school people make the, their own food for the students. And then there's lots of lots of things goes to the trash and we can collect them, make them mm -hmm. the Bokashi compost and it works at the gardening very well. So that, and we tried hot, hot compost, we tried in other ways, but uh, Bokashi compost works well in at the school. Mm -hmm. that's so good you're doing that mm. yeah for schools and restaurants i guess huh? julia has a question uh i <laughs> i don't have a question but i uh, today is very important for me uh, because my first uh, bokashi compost uh, uh meet the soil uh in a school uh, yeah. my do my daughter's school uh it's a primary school uh i i am i live in an apartment uh and uh, i have some uh worries about making compost uh but after everyone's uh pdc uh, course uh i uh, started to uh started to making the bokashi compost and uh, i want to uh, learn uh, teach uh, this uh, period uh, to uh, children 
So uh, it is. Uh, it was very lovely. <laughs> they were wow. uh, very uh, exciting, but they didn't uh, love the smell of bokashi. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> That's not surprising. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everything was uh, okay. The um, view of uh, co- compost uh, was okay. Smell was okay. Uh, and after one month, we will check uh, the uh, in the soil uh, what's going on there. After three months, uh, again we will check. So uh, children uh, will see uh, all these periods. It's very uh, important, I think, for children. Uh, my five years old saying uh, "bokashi compost." <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, at at the same time uh, we uh, started with. Uh, started uh, making uh, compost with her uh, and she is my reminder uh, she's saying uh, don't forget uh, liquid uh, compost liquid uh, l- like this hmm. uh, it's a very uh, good experience for me thank you very much everyone thank you very much Diane mm-hmm. I by the way I read the book book uh, I think I'm the uh, in Turkish uh, I think it, in 10 uh, person uh, reading the book uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much again uh, thank you that's it <laughs> thank you thank are you. you are you growing something at your daughter's school uh, yes, they are growing, but uh, I don't control uh, this. Uh, but I, uh, uh, at the same time, I've started to uh, grow in my balcony uh, tomato, pepper, uh, cucumber. Uh, I got um, seeds uh, from a um, food chamber, uh, good food chamber. I couldn't translate uh, very well, but gıda topluluğundan aldım şey tohumları İzmir'de. Food community maybe like mm-hmm. uh, fair mm-hmm. fair agriculture, like. people doing fair agriculture and there mm-hmm. are communities in Turkey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's it. Thank you. Today actually Hülya uh like every time we had a course, we all have these WhatsApp groups and uh, we we keep uh, these groups. We try to keep these groups alive, but actually we cannot. But uh, people like uh, enth- enthusiastic people like Hülya keeps them alive. But she, she shared his experience with the group today and the group. Some of the people in the group ex- get excited and they share their experiences. So we were we were so happy so and and the thing she he, she said that with the children we also heard that some uh, after our courses the mothers and fathers they tend to tell the story of compost and this life cycle to their children because it's an appealing story and they are when mm-hmm. they get excited they want their children to be in it and we've heard from some parents that p- children are now saying that uh, no, I'm not going to eat this. And the mom or the dad says that, no, eat it. It's going to be waste. And she or he <laughs> says, or they say, no, it's no, it's going to the compost. It's going to feed the soil. <laughs> so, and they can't say anything like, oh, you want the soil microbes to to suffer? They need to, to starve, uh, right? Yeah, to starve. So I'm not eating. So these are, I, I think, happy, happy stories. And, and also, I think this book is uh, is is because we're all, always talking about this is a life cycle plus this is a death cycle. So it's like by composting, you're going to be a part of this life cycle. And this book, uh, I think it also made our lives easier as instructors of permaculture because we'll just... Uh, actually, I, I started doing this now because we did a compost uh, workshop, I think, last, last week. And most of the things I was just uh, directing people to your book. <laughs> 
go buy Diane's <laughs> book and read it. It's in there. It's in there. So it's also helping us Be because I think uh, the English version is people are also asking me is this uh, I have the Turkish version this uh, the, the pictures and the jokes and they're saying that is it the Turkish version? No, the English version is the same. So it is actually I think you can just read this book with your kid and show uh, them the pictures. So it is a it's also made our lives easier in this respect, this book. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm honored. <laughs> children can read it and children can understand it also. Uh, maybe the secondary school student can understand it very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, lately, this teeming with serious microbes, fungi, and the minerals has been translated to Turkish also. I think it's been, it? mm -hmm. yeah, two months or a month. I don't know. Yeah. They are also in uh, oh, there it is. Turkish. Yeah, yeah, that's a great book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suggested these books to the uh, another publisher so that I'm proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're also yeah it's uh they are the also they are the ones actually they got me started also like you i i read them and i was fascinated by them so they're also yeah nice. and that's how i found out about elaine ingham from yeah. their book yeah brad lancaster's uh book about the uh, water harvesting it's on the way ah okay so you guys are busy yeah <laughs> So and and Dr. Elaine Ingham also maybe we should mention her again. Like uh, uh, she is also one of my heroes, and and I'm happy that I'm a student of her now. And like uh, we have a couple of uh, people who has graduated from his school of soil food web and be become like soil consultants in Turkey and Uraz and Gökçe. Actually, they've started the new company called HIFCO, so they are uh, soil consultants now. So I think this, these are all good progress uh, for our country. Uh, this people being interested in these issues, in these books, so, and I think this also a, a big a good sign that these big publishing companies are interested in this subject. Plus there are lots of new small publishing companies and some of them are, uh, Establish especially for this purpose, like to uh, to publish permaculture books or mm. books about soil or like uh, other uh, methods of uh, no-till agriculture or natural agriculture. So I think this is a, a good sign uh, for our country. It's exciting that that's yeah. got so much interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, Takimbe is one of the students of Elaine Ingham too. Oh, wow, wow, nice. And uh, Murataka Akru finished the course yeah. also. Yeah, and I we, And we have a class at the end of the June with Murat Uh He is going to teach us what he learned from the mm -hmm. Food Soil Web. Mm -hmm. Have you been uh, met with the Elaine Ingham or just you called each other or? We have just emailed back and forth. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, when I decided to write my book, I thought, well, it would be great if I could get her to write a, a forward. And mm -hmm. I emailed her. I, she's a, a friend of my friend who teaches permaculture here. And, and she was delightful. She was very gracious and kind and was willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abra has a comment. Diane, you have a comment from yeah chat session. Mm, I don't see it. Oh, let me. Okay, it's uh, I can read it. It's Ebru saying thank you, Diane, for your book. It's encouraging for the beginners. Gardening needs patience, and we need 
supporters your book gives guidance she says oh thank you yeah. this means a lot to me so are you planning on writing or any funny book because i like the way your your writing style i like your writing style so i would be waiting for a second book actually about any, anything <laughs> Maybe about gardening yeah i don't i don't think i have another gardening book in me i i have thought of maybe writing fiction but ah i i haven't thought of a plot so i'll i'll wait for inspiration yeah this is actually maybe it's it's not out of the subject because it's about you and uh, yeah i think you can write fiction because i really like the way i the way your uh, mind i don't interpret things like this can comments not comments suggestions and the analogy of building a house upside down so it's not only about knowing the soil but this i think you have uh, Yes, I'm. I'm kind of into literature and writing, and I like this style. So I think, yeah, you have this. You you can write a, a book, uh, a fiction, and maybe we will translate it again, but in another series, not okay. sustainable living, man. Right? <laughs> I will start thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> we are look forward of, forward of it because yeah. it's it's very like to. Uh, read your books. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, because I think as a as an instructor and uh, someone into books, I believe that it's not only the the knowledge, the wisdom, but I think storytelling is also important. It's like you you need to tell the story. Uh, to get people excited so because you can't teach anyone especially like I think no one not even the children you can't teach anyone anything you can just uh, I don't know give them some curiosity curiosity and mm -hmm. get them excited mm -hmm. uh, when they're excited and they're curious they'll just learn about it afterwards right so, yeah right. so I think storytelling is a important uh, feature uh, for a writer and for an instructor. I just bought a book by Orhan, Pumar, ah. which I yeah. haven't started, but yeah, a famous Turkish writer, right? Yeah, one of the most famous, and I think in in in Globe, it's he's the most famous because he mm -hmm. he has the Nobel Prize. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, he, he has a he has a different style, so I hope you like him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sentences are a little bit different. Yeah. Are they? I don't know yeah. how can they translate to the English, but uh -huh. for for Turkish, the sentences are too long. When you begin to read it, maybe you can forget at the beginning <laughs> when you come from. The, <laughs> you you forget what is what it was about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wish me luck. <laughs> no, I think I, I I believe that it's a good translation, <laughs> so it will be okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Actually, he has a muse museum. He has a book. Masmit uh, Müzesi. Kitabın adı da mı oydu? Kitabın adını unuttum. Uh, he has a book, it's uh, The Museum of Innocence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the name of the book, but he has a Museum of Innocence. I know. I know. Okay, the book is Museum of Innocence, and there is a Museum of Innocence uh, just in my neighborhood. So he has all these items in this museum, but they're all uh, coming from this book, which is a fiction. So you read this book, which is a fiction actually it's uh, it's made up and then you go and visit this museum and you see the items i don't know if i'm able to tell tell it but uh there are people coming to istanbul to when they read the book they are coming to istanbul to visit this museum because oh wow yeah because uh -huh. it's it, it kind of i don't know it makes it out of fiction and makes it real 
but it's a fiction. The museum is also fiction, but uh, it's an interesting experience. Uh, I know some people uh, came to Istanbul, especially to visit this museum. Wow. Uh, yeah. And the museum came before the book? I think after the book it came. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm not sure, but I think it's after the book it came, yeah. And I and think it, after the book also. After the book, yeah. After the book it came. So it's uh, it's it's a real different experience, like. Yeah. We'll so I have to get that one next. Yeah, another reason for you to come and <laughs> yeah. visit Istanbul. Visit my permaculture friends. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe on the way of the Vietnam, you can. Just spend Just more, two, two or more days in Istanbul <laughs> than go to Vietnam. And yeah. what are you going to do in there? Are I'm going on a, a tour. For with, a, with a place. A, Sorry? No, it's just a, a tour to um, various cultural spots. Mm. I'm going with a friend. My husband doesn't like to travel, so he stays home and takes care of the dogs. Ah, okay. <laughs> it works out well. Evet, soru var mıdır diye sorayım ben tekrar. Sorunuz, anlatacaklarınız, kitabın bir yerinde hissettikleriniz. Silence. Silence. Ee, bir saatin sonuna gelirken herhalde. <gülüyor> çok çok sessiz bir grup oldu bu yalnız. Evet. Bayağı bir sessiz oldu. Hiç bu kadar sessiz olacağını ummuyordum ben. Çok soru bekliyordum ama. I, I expected lots of questions and the people are very silent so that I just would like to motivate to them. <laughs> Maybe they haven't finished reading the book, like Gültekin Bey. <laughs> <laughs> Gültekin Bey promised that uh, he is going to finish the book because he received it Saturday mm -hmm. and he showed me the book. It's going to be finished next to the uh, meeting, he said. And so that I, I asked, did you finish it? I actually, I actually finished it. It's quite a nice book. In fact, it, it summarizes uh, what I've been learning in Elaine's course. Mm -hmm. And the translation is just great. Uh, everyone, mm. you've done a great job translating it. Ah, thank especially, you. Especially the jokes and the humor and the, the topics. The topic could be dry, but uh, Elaine also makes the topic quite interesting. Yeah. And having finished her first part of her course, the book summarizes. Uh, I wish I had the, I had the book before the course. Mm -hmm. so it could have made the course easier for me. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's a a hero of mine too. Yeah. Yeah. I hope to meet her uh, by the end of the year. Ah. Oh boy. Nice. Yeah, I, I haven't also finished the first uh, courses. And yeah. You're taking it online? Yeah, online. Yeah. So I think this is one of the uh, rare things that COVID has brought us like in a good way we saw everything became online so we were able to attend yeah i can't imagine doing this before covid yeah talking to istanbul i i took the whole grants course and it was nice too and uh, maybe bill Mollison, if he is alive it's probably to take from course from him it's going to be nice, but we miss it. Uh, the, the gift of the COVID is the course, uh, are the courses. Mm -hmm. And also connection with via Zoom or in other programs. We can communicate all over the world. Mm -hmm. This is just only the gift. 
from COVID. Yeah, it's amazing. Everybody's comfortable with Zoom now. Yeah. It was actually there before the COVID, but we weren't thinking about using it. It just, it wasn't making any sense, but now it is, yeah, yeah it's, this is but my- It doesn't work very well before the COVID. Ah, maybe, I don't know. It yeah. exists, so the, Skype or the other yeah. programs that exist, but it doesn't work as well as now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, the downside is uh, people are doing some courses online and having done any practicum, uh, they start teaching things. Uh, the, that's the big downside, unfortunately, especially yeah. in countries like Turkey. There's, as, as Didik said, there are about 1,500 PDCs. And if you were to do some oral examination, or examination similar to Elaine's courses, I'm sure there wouldn't be more than 100 PDCs. Mm -hmm. 1,000, 1,500. No, no, right, right, right now, 1,500. But the, the knowledge, skills, capabilities, and the, the soul in the PTC principles or culture, yeah. um, more than 100 of them pass the test. Hmm. It's all Zoom learning. Yeah. Hmm. It, it, it, yeah, basically. That's why Elaine's it, it, it, it, it course, the second part, uh, which I am in now uh, with the microscope, mm -hmm. uh, you're examined online uh, by the instructor. You have a yeah. camera, you have a camera looking into the microscope and you have to count the uh, bacteria and the uh, fungi and whatever. And uh, so the examiner sees whether you are counting properly or not, as if you are in the real lab, not just uh, online watching. It's nice watching those animals or microorganisms, but being able to recognize your sample and, and make a deduction from that for your clients is a different ball game. And then um, having the, the, the productivity or the, or the quality, I have a, even a, I just bought a digital bricks meter just to have a fun out of uh, Mm. Uh, mm. Test, testing uh, leaves because there's a doctor or somebody I forgot his name. He's so much fun of uh, doing big stuff on leaves as an indicator of uh, plant health. So, so that's, that's the thing. Do, do, I was doing online learning with the course era way before the COVID, mm -hmm. but that's okay in engineering maybe uh, or, or in management. But when it comes to uh, uh, plant and soil and and uh, and uh, even the compost. Uh, I mean, it, it's easy to tell how to do compost, and and mm. and, and doing it a different ball game, and doing that and using that to improve your plant and your soil uh, is a whole different game. So that's why I wish I wish there's some balance right now. After the online learning, maybe ninety percent of the people wouldn't be able to go to a real course because of the cost and other issues. Right, travel. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm impressed you're doing that. Yeah, it, it sure makes a difference. Like the, yeah, I was. Uh, I think it's been it's been three years. I think or be, it was before the COVID. COVID. I was in New Zealand. I worked with Kay Baxter when you said the brick bricks test. So she was also obsessed with this brick bricks test. So in Koanga Institute, so we used to do that a lot. So it. Yeah, it is not something that you can learn online. You have to do it there and learn it. But yeah, I don't know how it, it, it, it is going to be possible nowadays to go to New Zealand <laughs> to learn this. They are not even allowing you in the country because of the COVID now. So yeah, it changed. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree, but hands-on uh, experience is something else, yeah. Right. The designing course is important also not just only the hands-on experience the designing of the course is the another way mm -hmm. that's important point mm -hmm. Melis she has a question Melis uh, sorry I can't open my camera right now um, I want to ask you in our country it is desired that the parks and gardens are aesthetically very smooth and beautiful it is very difficult to use mulch in public areas 
and it is also very difficult to give up large grass areas which wants too much water. Uh, as a as a young landscape architect and also a permaculture designer, I have a hard time resisting this point of view. And um, how is the situation in your country or in your area? Um, how are mulching or compost issues in public parks and gardens? Um, they use a lot of uh, wood chips, which are seem to be acceptable aesthetically to the public. Uh, there, that's not the ideal. I think a mixed mulch is better. I, I personally rake, I have pine needles and leaves and then on my fancier areas, I put some wood chips on top and that makes it look like it's all wood chips. Um, it is a, an issue in public areas. Public areas, I mainly see wood chips, but more of that, that's progress anyway. And I also see more acceptance within neighborhoods of, of more casual, more informal gardens and vegetables in the front yard instead of lawns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question though. It's a tough conflict. Yeah, actually, yeah, we, we work with municipalities. It's a thing they, for mulch, they want to use pine wood chips. And mm -hmm. if you, and you keep using pine wood chips over and over again, you make the soil acidic. And actually it's, uh, it's not even doing what it's supposed to do, but uh, like we we have to keep trying trying to convince them we talked about this uh, green mulch living mulch all the, the ground cover species and i think the main point is if you can convince them that this would make their life easier less work plus it will be cheaper uh so they they they tend to buy it you know uh, aesthetic versus functionality at some point they tend to buy it especially in istanbul because all the watering cost and maintenance cost uh, it's increasing and uh, uh, they're trying to reduce their cost so maybe you can work on the cost thing and using less water thing less maintenance thing but i know it's hard to change uh, and the and the public's uh view perception of beauty has to change also actually mm -hmm. humans perception of beauty used to be this uh seeing the order in chaos like looking in a, a densely uh planted forest and enjoying it but now we are uh, i think we are taught to enjoy this more like clean and you know uh well-maintained gardens uh, but I'm I'm I'm hopeful. I think because the Melis, you are one. There are lots of people. We're trying, and we'll keep trying. We'll keep talking. So things will change slowly, for better, for the environment. I believe. Yeah, and as people see more examples of beautiful gardens that are more native and yeah more natural then that will spread mm -hmm. yeah I, I can just give one last example is uh, in istanbul uh if uh, anybody noticed uh, more and more in more and more public spaces they are using rosemaries it's a it's a herb uh it's it's good for the bees they're not using it for culinary purposes but it needs less maintenance less water and it's good for the pollinators so we start to see rosemaries everywhere there weren't any rosemaries uh two years ago so i think slowly it will change with rosemaries they will come some companion planting and everything's going to change i think in a while in a, for after a while mm -hmm. Back. 
is studying agriculture and write the thesis about the permaculture. So if there isn't any question, uh, we are going to let the Diane free. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very nice being here. Thank you. It's very nice to meet you, Diane. Yeah. And nice to meet thank you. you very much for taking time and uh, to be with us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It's a pleasure to see you and very nice to meet you face to face. Hope yeah. that one day we are really come together face to face. I hope so too. I know where to find you. Yeah. <laughs> and thank yeah, you, and to like, you uh, Aaron, for good translation and to finding the book and translate it. Yeah, thank you. And because I, as I said, I love the book and I actually I was I in uh, at some level I was hoping to meet with Diane, but I actually didn't have any idea. And Delay came up with this idea and it was brilliant, actually. Why not? It's a great idea. Delay, t thank you for this idea. I wouldn't have thought of it. So uh, it is nice. Thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed it and thank you, Diane, for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me to Turkey. Herkese iyi akşamlar diliyoruz o zaman. Yeniden görüşmek dileğiyle. Hoşça kalın. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. İyi akşamlar.